Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12980 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme for today. If anyone objects to the new programme, please say so now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. <coughs> no one has objected to the motion. The question therefore is that motion 12980 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We turn now to Topical questions, and we start with question number one from Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that ScotRail missed its punctuality targets for every reporting period in the last year. Minister Hamza Youssef. The target sets contained in the ScotRail franchise are challenging, but realistic contractual regime to ensure the punctuality of our rail services are at the forefront of ScotRail's priorities. It should be noted that nearly 90 out of 100 trains, 89, 0.3% still arrive within PPM. Of course, that is better than the value of Great Britain as a whole, which is at 87-odd percent. And ScotRail, of course, continues to be the best large operator in the UK. The Donovan review recommendations are all underway. Skip stopping is reduced from 1%, as it was earlier this year, to 0.09% last period. Further performance improvements will be seen over the coming months as we have new rolling stock coming into service. I continue to monitor ScotRail's performance very closely. My officials at Transport Scotland are working with ScotRail to see our sustained improvements in its performance. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister is correct. The, those targets are set as part of the franchise agreement and they're being missed. Now, given that ScotRail failed to hit those targets once during the past year, can the Transport Minister tell us whether he anticipates that they'll hit their target any time during the forthcoming year? Minister. Of course we'll be pushing ScotRail to meet their targets. That is my job. That is Transport Scotland's job. But let me just try to wrap some context uh, around this if I can. Today, ScotRail's performance, of course, is at 92%. The UK national average is 81%. Uh, when it comes to uh, missing their targets, and I agree with Colin Smith, of course, it's not acceptable that they're missing those targets. They are missing them by a percent, a percent and a half. It is not a catastrophic decline in their performance by any stretch of the imagination. So, uh, you know, I will continue to press them, will continue to push them, but of course, performance or PPM or moving annual average is just one measure of the passenger experience. Skip stopping has reduced that, has been welcomed. I've had that from passengers uh, themselves. Of course, new entry into service of rolling stock will help with the capacity issues in ScotRail. And all of these measures, I think, need to be taken uh, holistically. Colin Smith. Thank you, President. Also, I noticed the Minister didn't say that he anticipates that ScotRail will hit those key targets in, in the forthcoming year. Now, given that and the fact that they've missed them in the last year, it's a little wonder that, that a recent poll put public support for renationalising the railways at over two-thirds, and our rail workers and the unions who represent them also support public ownership of a railway. So, so can the Transport Minister tell us, and what may or may not be his last question in, in his role, does he and the Scottish Government believe our railways, track and trains should all be brought back under public ownership, yes or no? Minister. Too often in our history, we talked about ownership models for rail without also uh, thinking clearly enough about what, what we wanted to do with the network itself. Uh, I've seen somebody shouting, that wasn't me, that was Welsh Labour Government Minister Ken Skates, who of course just awarded a £5 billion private contract to private country for Welsh, uh, of course, for Welsh railways. So uh, he, he demands that we nationalise the railway. Jeremy Corbyn demands that we nationalise the railways. But the one place where Labour actually empower, they award their rail contract to a private company. So I'm not going to take any lectures from Colin Smith on public ownership. Of course, in 13 years in government in the UK, they did hee-haw about it. Eight years in Scottish government, they did hee-haw about it. We've been in power for the last 11 years. We have changed the law to allow a pet public sector rail bid, and they have done nothing but sat on their hands. So he'll forgive me if I uh, don't take any lectures from him on the state of our railway. Fulton McGregor. No, sir, it's following on from that very point. Given that it was successive Labour and Tory governments who continually denied the right for a public sector operator to bid for a rail franchise, and instead this option was secured by the SNP as a result of the Smith Commission, Will the Minister agree with me that this is nothing but hypocrisy, especially as Labour seemingly do one thing in opposition and another thing in government? Minister. It's a case of, of do as I say, not uh, as I do. And what I would say to, to Colin Smith, and uh, I made this point to Fulton McGregor too, uh, even if they uh, are going to look one way in Wales and look one way in Scotland, what they should at least have the guts to do is stand with the Scottish Government instead of siding with the Tories when it comes to devolution of network rail. Uh, we believe that, of course, network rail should be devolved here to Scotland. They are, of course, responsible for now 59% of rail delays 
are directly attributable to the infrastructure which is under the control of Network Rail, which in turn is under control of the UK Government Department for Transport. So it would be good if the Labour Party, instead of siding with the Tories on the railways, came and joined the Scottish Government and called for further devolution of Network Rail to Scotland. Jamie Green. Uh, can I ask the Minister what options are available to him to ensure that the ScotRail Alliance can and will meet its contractual obligations under the franchise and when he or anyone who follows him expects punctuality to simply get back on time. Minister. Again, I go back to my point that I made to Colin Smith. It is not the catastrophic uh, context that uh, Jamie Green attempts to, to portray it as at all. Uh, they are, yes, behind their target, and I will push them, and Transport Scotland will push them to go further. Uh, but in other performance measures, when it comes to the reduction of skip stopping, it is going in the right direction. When it comes to addressing overcrowding, which we hear collectively, I'm sure, from, from our constituents, it is going in the right direction with three sets of new rolling stock to come into entry in the coming months. But of course, there are uh, financial penalties uh, uh, or indeed financial uh, incentives uh, that, that are available. He knows probably about the Squire Fund, I'm sure. We continue to hold ScotRail robustly to that when it comes to the cleanliness of the rolling stock, when it comes to the stations. And when it comes to performance measures, of course, we do have uh, measures within the contract to deal with that, but they are nowhere near the level that they would have to be in order for breach of contract and so on and so forth. So again, I just make the point that context is wholly important in this discussion. And John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Minister, uh, there's many positive things ScotRail do, but the, 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 the percentage of people who are delayed by trains, that affects their employment, it affects their health appointments, it affects schooling and all the rest. Now, we only seem to hear about uh, public sector bids when things aren't going too, too well. And I'd hope to hear a lot more about a public sector bid before the end of term. Where is that? And when are you going to take positive action to address the concerns that are legitimately held by members of the public? Minister. I think John Finney makes a good point around the effect that rail delays can have on, on your average passenger. I think that's absolutely correct. It's why there is a, a delay repay uh, scheme. And of course, Scotland are doing more to advertise that so more people uh, can rightly be compensated uh, when their journey is delayed. What I would say to John Finney in the public sector rail, but again, it is this government that made a change in the law. We could have, of course, gone further if uh, full devolution of railway powers wasn't blocked by the Labour Party during the Smith Commission. Uh, what I would say is on the public sector rail bid, uh, watch this space closely. We uh, promise to make an announcement uh, on that very, very shortly. He's been involved in the cross-party and cross-trade union working on this. He knows we're looking very actively at a range of options, and I'll be hoping to make an announcement on that uh, shortly. And question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the result of the UK Parliament's vote on Heathrow expansion and its implications for Scotland. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, the Scottish Government welcomes that the third uh, runway project is now moving to the stage of Heathrow applying for a development consent order, but notes that, of course, some MPs across all the political parties were not persuaded to support the UK Government's national policy statement. Uh, it is now incumbent on the UK Government to build more confidence in the process and more clearly set out the economic benefits which a third runway at Heathrow can deliver throughout the UK. The Scottish Government's position remains that Scotland should benefit proportionately from the new runway capacity and that this should be subject to guarantee. And we note the Secretary of State's commitment made during last night's Westminster debate on 200 additional weekly flights for Scotland. However, we, of course, await the detail of that. The UK Government's aviation strategy to be published later in 2018 will have a significant role to play in setting out how the UK government intends to deal with the issues such as slot allocation for services to Heathrow for the nations and regions. The Scottish government will work constructively with the UK government on that new strategy. I note the concerns conveyed during last night's debate and the potential environmental implications from the new capacity. Whilst we're not responsible for the third uh, runway, the Scottish government is not divorced from the potential environmental consequences as, of course, a leader in tackling climate change. Jamie Green. Expansion at Heathrow offers significant job creation, major investment opportunities, and we look forward to working with Heathrow to bring those significant benefits of a third runway to Scotland. Not my words, presiding officer, not my words, not even those of the UK government, but those of Keith Brown and the SNP government here in Scotland. But nowhere, nowhere in Mr Yousaf's answer today did he explain why the SNP has reneged on its memorandum of understanding that it signed with Heathrow on a third runway. Nowhere did he answer why its part, uh, his party did not support the creation of the thousands of jobs that expansion will create or the hundreds of new flights that it will bring to Scotland. So let me ask the minister a simple question. Does the Scottish government wholeheartedly support Heathrow expansion? 
Yes or no, Minister? Minister. Uh, yes, we still support the, uh, the third run. We, uh, he threw, I made that position clear in my opening answer. I, I know Tory MSPs are used to rolling over and doing whatever Theresa May tells them uh, whenever she wants. Our MPs are absolutely right to demand that they get cast iron guarantees around the 200 additional flights. We also, of course, need confidence on the climate considerations. Why on earth? Why on earth did the UK government push, with a, push forward with a vote days before an important report from the Independent Climate Change Committee was due to be published on aviation emissions? Why on earth was the vote not held afterwards? So, uh, for the, with the greatest of respect, I'll take no lectures from Jamie Green, you know, when he is a, a member of the party that has the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, who said he would lie down in front of bulldozers. He wasn't doing so much lying down as he was doing flying away. Jamie Green. So the Cabinet Secretary is somehow saying that the Scottish Government supports a third runway, Heathrow, but it begs the question why its MPs in Westminster did not support it. The new runway was backed by the First Minister, it was backed by the Finance Secretary, the Economy Secretary and even the Transport Secretary himself. Yet, when it came to the crucial vote, the SNP abstained. They ducked out in another grievance-stoking stunt in Westminster. The question is, who gave the order? and why, and if we were to believe reports, the First Minister herself ordered MPs not to back it. So, Cab uh, Minister, doesn't this all just go to show that given the choice between stirring up an argument or boosting jobs and the economy in Scotland, for the SNP, it's always party first and everything else second? Minister. Uh, quite unbelievable. I've already explained that they don't have the cast iron guarantees. If the member could stand up and tell me how those 200 slots will be allocated, I will be all ears. And he absolutely can't. And when it comes to the environmental consequences of the third runway, our MPs are absolutely right to demand the detail of that. So yes, in principle, we have the support of the third runway, but that is not, that is conditional, unlike the Tory MSPs who will roll over and do whatever Theresa May and the UK government tell them, we will not, that is why we will stand up for Scotland demand, demand those guarantees. And of course, I'll leave him to complain about this, not just from the sidelines, but actually to do whatever it is that the UK government tells uh, the Tory party to do. Mike Rumbles. Now, I want to pursue this, but until this morning, it was Keith Brown that was supposed to answer this question. <clears throat> and I know the minister's in the hot seat now, maybe not as prepared, but does the minister agree with me that for Keith Brown to sign, to, to engage, to quote him, engage extensively with Heathrow, sign another memorandum of understanding, as we've already heard, talk up the deal he had negotiated for almost two years, and then have SNP MSPs abstain in the vote is an unmitigated embarrassment for Keith Brown and the government. And to pursue the point, was it the First Minister that instructed M SNP MPs to abstain? Minister. Unbelievable, I guess, from Mike Rumbles, because... When I, look at the, when I look at the Scottish Liberal Democrat MPs, I know, and there may be very good reason for this, but I note that not all the Scottish Liberal Democrats MPs also voted in favour of the third runway. So what I would say to Mike Rumbles is we are taking an evidence-based approach. That is not to, not to simply believe what Theresa May has to say. I know previously the Lib Dems have accepted what the Conservatives have said without, of course, standing up to the Conservatives when they were in coalition with the UK government, but we don't take that approach. We're demanding assurances on those 200 additional flights. We're demanding assurances on the environment, which is something I would expect Liberal Democrats to be uh, joined with us uh, in demanding from the UK government. So we'll continue to take an evidence-based approach. This government has that MOU with Heathrow, which is, of course, different to the actions of the government. What we're demanding is action from the UK government, and I would expect Instead of siding with the Tory MSPs in this one, he would be more on side with us. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Does the Minister agree that the UK Government should have ensured the MPs were able to take a fully informed decision on expanding Heathrow by holding the vote after the publication of the Independent UK Committee on Climate Change Emissions Report? Minister. Yes, ab absolutely. And I cannot for the life of me understand how politically tone deaf this UK Government continues to be. So while we have... Uh, no responsibility for the information provided for MPs beforehand. Given the importance of the decision, you would have expected that MPs would have received sufficient 
information alongside the appropriate time to consider uh, that information. So when we have the independent UK Committee on Climate Change emission reports due within days, to hold the vote before that uh, is exactly the reason why uh, I'm sure our MPs, one of the reasons why our MPs abstain, but I've got a feeling it's why Tory MPs would have voted against, as some did, as why Labour MPs, some of which voted against or indeed abstain, did for that very, very reason. So, yes, the UK government uh, have made a, a mistake for that, and we look for the assurances from the UK government uh, around uh, climate change and the emissions uh, uh, from the third runway. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Chris Grayling, the UK Transport Secretary, was widely pilloried for making a statement on Heathrow expansion without ever once mentioning the issue of climate change. But the, the SNP's position is equally risible. What on earth is it that the Minister thinks he's going to read in the Climate Change Committee's report when it's published that is going to overcome the objective reality that more flights means more emissions, and in particular, more short-haul flights between Scotland and London, when we have rail alternatives and surface alternatives to use, is completely unnecessary. Isn't it clear that this proposal blows a hole in UK government climate change policies and in Scottish government's climate change policies and leaves them without any shred of credibility? Minister. No, it's a ridiculous assertion. This is the government that, of course, has brought forward world-leading climate change targets, which is meeting those targets, uh, and, of course, has brought forward radical action, whether it's in my own portfolio on transport in relation to uh, 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 low-emission zone when it comes to electric vehicles or, indeed, uh, anything else. And when it comes to those climate change targets, it's worth mentioning, of course, that it is this government that has ensured that aviation emissions and other transport emissions are included within those targets that we have. So yes, the independent, climate, uh, independent UK Committee on Climate Change report is hugely important to us, is vital to us, and of course, MPs will be looking, and well, the Scottish Government will be looking for those assurances from the UK Government. For Patrick Harvey to say we have no shred of any credibility on this, uh, I'm afraid uh, just doesn't uh, match with the reality. Thank you. I'm afraid that concludes topical questions. Apologies to the members who uh, wish to ask further questions. There's just not quite enough time this afternoon.